Please stand for the call to worship. Give thanks to the Lord and call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the peoples. Sing to him. Sing praises to him. Speak of all his wondrous works. Glory in his holy name. Let the heart of those who seek the Lord be glad. Seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his face continually. Remember his wonders which he has done, his marvels and the judgments uttered by his mouth. He is Yahweh our God. His judgments are in all the earth. Let's call upon God together. There is none like you among the gods, O Lord, nor are there any works like yours. All the nations you have made shall come and worship before you, O Lord, and shall glorify your name. For you are great and do wondrous things. You alone are God. Teach me your way, O Lord, that I may walk in your truth. Give me an undivided heart to revere your name. Well, your God loves you and greets you. To you, loved by God, called to be saints, the conquerors who overcome the world and darkness and shall inherit the crown of life, grace and peace in the election of the Father, by the blood of the Son and the regeneration of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us then confess that God has revealed himself and we believe he is the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Spirit, and he has established for himself this body, the Church. Let us confess. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, begotten from the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of the same essence as the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven. He became incarnate by the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary and was made man. He was crucified for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. The third day he rose again according to the scriptures. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again with glory to judge the living and the dead. His kingdom will never end. And we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life. He proceeds from the Father and the Son, and with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified. He spoke through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We affirm one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look forward to the resurrection from the dead and to life in the world to come. Amen. Well, in affirming that we believe in resurrection and everlasting life, we are going to sing today Psalms 24, 25, and 26. So remember, book one of the Psalms, a kingdom is being established, but Psalm 20, 21, there's a question about, is the king supported by God and God uphold the king? By Psalm 22, we discover, however, the king is going to be forsaken for the sake of his people, but will ultimately lead them. And then the Psalm of Confidence 23, the Lord is my shepherd. And that brings us to Psalm 24, that with the king who is the shepherd, we will be led into the house of God. So Psalm 24 then sets the wonders of what it means to be given the certain hope of ascending into eternal glory. So we will sing Psalm 24, the earth and its riches. The earth and its riches abundantly stored. The world and its dwellers belong to the Lord. For he on the seeds its foundations has laid. And firm on the water its pillars has stayed. Oh, who shall the mountain? Lord God ascend, and to in the place of his holiness stand, the man of your heart and of hands without stain, who swears not to idols, nor serves what is vain. Yes, he from the Lord shall a blessing receive. 
the God of salvation shall righteousness give. Thus looking to him is a whole blessed race. All those who like Jacob are seeking your face. O gates, lift your heads, ancient doors, lift them high. The great King of glory to enter draws nigh. O who is the King that in glory draws near? The Lord, mighty Lord of the battle is here. O gates, lift your heads, ancient doors, lift them high. The great King of glory enter draws nigh this great king of glory oh who can it be the lord god of hosts king of glory is he please be seated well the psalm speaks of the king of glory entering and it asks who may be this king and it is one who must be holy and perfect, upright, never worshiping idols, never doing sin. And yet, sinful psalmists are called to sing this and be confident of it. Well, how can that be? Well, let's turn to the law and see how God not only shows us what is righteousness, but how he gives to us that righteousness by which we may enter the holy mountain. Let us then remind one another and ourselves of the use and purpose of the law that God has given us. Let's recite together. The word of God is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. In his word, he tells us what is good and what he requires of us, to do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. But instead, we ignore the clear commands and perform acts not required by God. Ceremonies, fastings, prayer vigils, making unnecessary vows, which have only the appearance of wisdom. But we will not humble ourselves, give up our sins, and obey the plain commands of God. All of us have sinned, and the wages of our sin is death. So the warning here is don't try to ascend the mountain of the Lord in your self-made religion of ceremonies and fastings and vows when God has actually called us to be imitators of him as revealed in his law. We're going to see even that won't work when we fail. But hear then the law of God. Understand this is the character and nature of what God wants you to have as your, your own person. I am Yahweh, your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall not murder. So, beloved, what is God's will for you in the sixth commandment? Let's answer. That I am not to belittle, hate, insult, or kill my neighbor, not by my thoughts, my words, my look or gesture, and certainly not by actual deeds. And I am not to be a party to this in others. Rather, I am to put away all desire for revenge. I am not to harm or recklessly endanger myself either. Prevention of murder is also why government is armed with the sword. So when God says you shall not commit murder, does he refer only to the physical act of murder? How do you respond? By forbidding murder, God teaches us that he hates the root of murder, envy, hatred, anger, vengefulness. In God's sight, all such are disguised forms of murder. Okay, so if I avoid these things, if I just not interact with people, not think about them, can I fulfill the law? Is it enough then that I do not murder my neighbor in such a way? Let's answer. No, by condemning envy, hatred, and anger. God wants us to love our neighbors as ourselves, to be patient, peace-loving, gentle, merciful, and friendly toward them, to protect them from harm as much as we can, and to do good even to our enemies. Well, who may ascend the mountain of the Lord? It is one who not only does not have in his heart a desire for revenge or holds hate and envy, but one who loves even his enemies and does good for them. And the only one who's done this is Jesus Christ, as when we were his enemies, he died for us, so he alone is able to ascend and have the gates open wide to him. Well, 
That's a problem for us. Because as much as we will try, we are never going to fulfill this law perfectly. Not that we shouldn't pursue it actively. We must. But understand that you are prone, whether you want to admit it or not, to be the vile person described here, one who belittles, hates, and insults others, one who actually isn't all that sad when some people get killed because you just didn't happen to like them. They were inconvenient, and that can be personal or tribal. And rarely are you or I described by those who interact with us as patient, peace-loving, peacemaking, gentle, merciful, and friendly, to such a point that we will protect others from harm as much as we can and do good even unto our enemies. It's an admission, but it's a tragic admission because it means we are excluded from the kingdom of God if our entrance would be dependent on this law and our keeping it. However, there's good news of the gospel that we're going to turn to. Beloved, God must punish all sin. His wrath, judgment, is upon all his enemies, but he does not take pleasure in the death of the wicked. Rather, Jesus reveals to us, God so, so much loved the world. He gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. So Jesus came and died for our sins. He made himself subject to the wrath and the curse for us in our place. And now if you believe and confess Jesus is God, King, Lord, but also that he took on flesh and was crucified, and then he was raised from the dead, you will be saved from the wrath of God, which will come down upon the ungodly. So, first... Did you accomplish what was commanded here in this law? How do you answer? I confess that left to myself, I am unable to do any good because I am hostile to God and unable to subject myself to his law and am even by nature a child of wrath. Okay, so you are excluded from entering the holy place. So where's your hope? I will place my hope in the work of Christ alone who died for my sins and was raised for my justification, who has become my righteousness and redemption apart from my own works and attempts to keep the law. Well, if I'm freely saved in Jesus Christ, how am I now going to live? What's going to be my response to this? I recognize my high calling, signed and sealed in my baptism, and will walk in newness of life, a slave to righteousness, under the sanctifying work of the Spirit, thankful to God for his blessings. Beloved, what is so incredible is God is not asking us to fool him or to delude ourselves, but to confess reality. We have sinned against him and then to rely on the provision he makes. As one who has loved even his enemies and made the payment, he says, come to me and I will cancel out the guilt of your sin, and I will make you a new creation, and you will be honored as my sons and daughters in the world. So let's go before God and confess our sins, especially as we have seen in the Sixth Commandment, and seek mercy in Jesus Christ. Our Lord and our God, we are very stubborn and foolish, and it is difficult for us to acknowledge the gravity of what we have just heard about true holiness revealed in your law. We content ourselves with not simply going out and actually murdering others, but we fail to love even our friends adequately, let alone our enemies. But Lord, the love that we are to have worked in us by your Spirit is the love that Christ had, that he took on our flesh and died for us in our place while we were the enemies. Help us to understand the depth of the love that you've had, that we should understand what it means that we are now your children and we are to bear your image. Help us to understand that we are called to a life of service, gratitude, love and worship of the King, and also a desire to bring the light of the gospel that you revealed to the nations. As those who enjoy this privilege, may we not take it for granted. 
May we never become contemptuous of these things or believe we deserve them, but instead, all the days of our lives be truly thankful, filled with joy for this gift we have received, and with that joyful zeal, proclaim your name and Christ's cross to the whole world. Lord, we ask that each and every one of us would not only be assured of your love and the work that Christ did, but also desire that we would more and more be conformed to the glorious image of so loving a Savior and God. And may you receive the glory and honor due to your name in all the earth. Amen. Beloved, I ask you now to please stand to hear these righteous judgments of God proclaimed in the earth and particularly to you, his people. Beloved, to you who by faith have confessed and repented of your sins and trusted in Jesus' sufficiency and merit alone, I declare in the name of Christ and by the authority of his word, your sins are forgiven, the record of your transgressions is blotted away, and your everlasting salvation is hid now in Christ Jesus, who will resurrect you in the last day. As the psalmist wrestled with who may ascend the mountain of the Lord, and he could recognize only the righteous one of God could, he also saw that God would make a provision that he will send and give a blessing to those who are righteous. So Psalm 25, then the psalmist confesses his sin in order that his guilt being placed on the sacrifice that God would provide the lamb who takes away the sin of the world, his guilt would be canceled and he could then go with the assembled saints and enter the mountain of the Lord. So let us now sing a psalm of confession, Psalm 25, Lord to you I lift my soul. Forgive 
Please be seated. You see how the psalmist, first confessing that he is a sinner by verses 19 through 22, he looks upon his foes and does not ask for destruction, but rather that his soul be guarded and that he be faithful and trust in God and wait upon him. And so you see how the sixth commandment affects his thinking. We turn now to the matters for prayer. We pray for our church. We pray for the missionary of the URC, Ken Anima, working in prisons uh, in Indiana and Illinois where they seek to teach the gospel to prisoners. And then you see the people's groups and nations that we are praying for uh, found there in the matters for prayer. Let's pray. Our great God and heavenly Father, we thank you this day for the blessings that we enjoy in Christ Jesus as a redeemed people a people who undeservedly have been elected to life and purchased by Jesus' blood on the cross and by the Spirit of God regenerated and made a new creation, and now the body of Christ united to Jesus our head. We come before you then as your people, your sons and daughters, loved and chosen by you. And we ask that the Spirit will continue to work in our hearts and our minds that more and more our thoughts will be conformed to the revelation in the scriptures, and we will delight in your holy law, and especially we will praise you for the gospel of grace. Help us to understand and believe these things more fully that we would be able to proclaim the excellencies of your grace. And we pray for this work of the gospel to be truly effective among the people we love, and we cry out to you for our sisters, our brothers, our husbands, our wives, our sons, and our daughters. Lord, we ask that you do not allow any that we love to perish, but instead give to us a zeal and joy and a desire to always persevere in prayer, but also that we would be aware that they are observing us. And we pray that you will conform our lives more and more to your word so that by the power of your spirit transforming us, they will see how effective you are in making us a new creation and making us prepared to dwell in the house of God forever. And so you know our hearts, you know how much we grieve and you know our weakness that we will not be able to fulfill our call. So we ask you to work in us by your spirit and use us as instruments to bring this hope of gospel to our families, our friends, our neighborhoods, but especially in the mission of the church that this body of believers, this particular assembly that you gather today would be a light in the darkness and that this light would shine in such a way that it would draw to you a people who are now in death and in darkness. Bring them now to the kingdom of light and life. Lord, we pray for our own work that we do as a congregation and especially to be mindful that we are called to encourage one another. Yes, it is very easy to remember other people's failings, but that is not our job. Our duty is to see the needs of others and to minister to them. And so encourage us, O Lord, and by your spirit guide us to be able to love others as you loved us and to minister to one another in such a way that we build up the saints, that they can be truly thankful for having known us, that indeed, we have encouraged them to love in good works. We also ask that knowing our weakness, that we be open to this encouragement for ourselves as well, so that we would not be simply lukewarm to be spit out, but rather that we would indeed have zeal and desire for the glory of your name, however costly it may be for us, even forgiving our enemies, that you would build up your church and show this glory of peace that reigns in our hearts. 
Lord, we pray for the works in Ventura and Armenia you've given us the privilege to be part of, and we ask that these works would be fruitful and a blessing to the neighborhoods in which they find themselves, and especially for the Armenian people to be restored to that, that which they brag of, of being the first Christian nation. Lord, may they be a current Christian nation as you bring the gospel and the hope of life to a people who live quite often in darkness. Lord, we pray for people's groups that are blinded in loyalty and fidelity to idols and false gods and the traditions of their fathers. We pray for the Bil and the Gond people who are unfortunately deceived by Hinduism. Lord, we pray for the gospel to break forth in the lives of these people's groups and that the gospel would go forth and transform these groups from being known as Hindus to those who are known as Christian because you are so gracious. Lord, we pray for the Uyghur and Maduro peoples who are caught up in the lies of Islam. And we ask that you no, no longer allow them to continue on in this blindness, but that you would be gracious and Christ would be proclaimed among them and your spirit would go forth and turn the hearts back to you. We also pray for the nations of Afghanistan and Albania. And Lord, our hearts go out for the Christian community of Afghanistan because they have lived through much turmoil and now they are being aggressively persecuted such that many have fled or are in hiding and many have died. But Lord, we rejoice that they preserve the witness, but now we ask for fruit from their work. Do not despise, O oh God, the blood of the saints, as you promised you would never do. Lord, may their work not be fruitless, but may the gospel go forth in Afghanistan. And in Albania, which has been troubled by generations of Islam and atheism, now we pray for the gospel to once again be proclaimed there as it was around the time of the apostles and the peoples of these lands would no longer cling to lies, but instead be freed in the truth of Jesus Christ. Lord, we know that we are often caught up in the affairs of the state and our, of our own material things. Lord, we ask that you would care for us as you have asked us to pray for our daily bread. We ask you to give us assurance of your fatherly love in every affair that we undergo. We pray for our own nation that you will raise up wise and just leaders and rulers so that they will not seek to glorify themselves, but instead would seek to do the good they have been commanded to do. We pray for your churches to be led by people who desire to see you glorified and the people minister to rather than quite often the blasphemous lies that are told or the self-aggrandizing ways that many have built up empires for themselves but have never proclaimed the gospel. Lord, we do not brag. We know our own failings. We come before you thankful for what we have received and asking of you. Continue to lead us that we would crucify our foolish natures and be led in the way of truth so that the people would see in our lives, especially in this congregation, Christ and him crucified and the glorious hope of the gospel. And may we therefore with faith and confidence declare that we know because of the work of Christ, you are our God and Father. And we pray, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Please stand now for the reading of the written word. We begin with the Old Testament, Jeremiah chapter 1 and chapter 7. We are going to look at the threats of punishment fulfilled against sinful Israel. Jeremiah 1, 13 through 16. And the word of the Lord came to me a second time, saying, What do you see? And I said, A boiling pot facing away from the north. And the Lord said to me, Out of the north disaster shall be let loose on all the inhabitants of the land. For behold, I am calling all the tribes of the kingdoms of the north, declares the Lord, and they shall come, and every one shall set his throne at the entrance of the gates of Jerusalem, against its walls all around and against all the cities of Judah. And I will declare my judgments against them for all their evil in forsaking me. 
They have made offerings to other gods and worshiped the works of their own hands. 7, 2 through 4. Stand in the gate of the Lord's house and proclaim there this word and say, Hear the word of the Lord, you men of Judah, enter these gates to worship the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Amend your ways and your deeds, and I will let you dwell in this place. Do not trust in these deceptive words. This is the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. Verses 11 and 12. Has this house, which is called by my name, become a den of robbers in your eyes? Behold, I myself have seen it, declares the Lord. Go now to my place that was in Shiloh, where I made my name dwell at first, and see what I did to it because of the evil of my people Israel. Complete change in tone, chapter 31. At that time, declares the Lord, I will be the God of all the clans of Israel, and they shall be my people. Thus says the Lord, the people who survived the sword found grace in the wilderness. When Israel sought for rest, the Lord appeared to him from far away. I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, I have continued my faithfulness to you. Again, I will build you, and you shall be built, O virgin Israel. Again, you shall adorn yourself with tambourines and shall go forth in the dance of merrymakers. Again, you shall plant vineyards on the mountains of Samaria. The planter shall plant and shall enjoy the fruit. For there shall be a day when the watchman will call in the hill country of Ephraim, Arise and let us go to Zion to the Lord our God. For thus says the Lord, Sing aloud with gladness for Jacob, and raise shouts for the chief of the nations. Proclaim, give praise, and say, O Yahweh, save your people, the remnant of Israel. Behold, I will bring them from the north country, and gather them from the farthest parts of the earth. Among them, the blind and the lame, the pregnant woman and she who is in labor together. A great company shall return here. With weeping they shall come, and with pleas for mercy I will lead them back. I will make them walk by brooks of water in a straight path in which they shall not stumble. For I am a father to Israel, and Ephraim is my firstborn. Hear the word of the Lord, O nations, and declare it in the coastlands far away. Say, He who scattered Israel will gather him and will keep him as a shepherd keeps his flock. For the Lord has ransomed Jacob and redeemed him from the hands of those too strong for him. They shall come and sing aloud on the height of Zion and shall be radiant over the goodness of the Lord, over the grain, the wine, the oil, and over the young and the flock and the herd. Their life shall be like a watered garden. They shall languish no more. Skipping to verse 27. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will sow the house of Israel and the house of Judah with the seed of man and the seed of beast. And it shall come to pass that as I have watched over them to pluck them up and break them down, to overthrow, destroy, and bring harm, so I will watch over them to build and to plant, declares the Lord. In those days they shall no longer say, The fathers have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. But everyone shall die for his own iniquity. Each man who eats sour grapes, his teeth will be set on edge. Behold, the days are coming, declares Yahweh, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant that they broke, though I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them. I will write it on their hearts. And I will be their God. They shall be my people. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me. From the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sins no more. Turning to the New Testament. 2 Corinthians 3, 4 through 6. Such is the confidence that we have through Christ toward God. Not that we are sufficient in ourselves to uh, to claim anything as coming from us, but our sufficiency is from God who has made us sufficient to be ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. Hebrews 8, starting at verse 7. If that first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no occasion to look for a second. 
But finding fault with them, he says, or finding fault to them, he says, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will establish a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not like the covenant that I made with the fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. For they did not continue in my covenant, and show, so I showed no concern for them, declares the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my laws into their minds and write them on their hearts. I will be their God, they shall be my people. And they shall not teach each one his neighbor and each one his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, for I will be merciful toward their iniquities, and I will remember their sins no more. And speaking of a new covenant, he makes the first one obsolete. Whatever is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. So far the written word. We ask, O oh God, to be able to understand the fullness of your revelation and the work that you have done, the promises you have made, and they, how they are fulfilled in Christ Jesus. May we not only understand, but may we believe. And believing, find joy and comfort in all your love for us revealed in Christ Jesus. Amen. Please be seated. We live in a world that is imperfect, and there are problems. And no matter how many times people seek to encourage and motivate us and all the different aids we try to give ourselves for accomplishing the good, we often fail. And so if we are going to be rewarded for our good accomplishments, at the end, we will receive nothing but judgment. In the end, no matter how hard you try, how healthy you eat, how much you exercise, you're all going to wind up in the grave. So we need to understand that there is a works-based economy that in the end does not yield a positive result. Because in order for works to yield a good reward, the works would have to be perfect. Instead, we have kind of a modified system that we kind of live in today. When you go and shop, you're not assuming the person that you are purchasing from is an ideal human being. You only want them not to lie about the product you are getting and to give you a fair price. And that's pretty much all you give your, employee, uh, your employers too. We just kind of live with this level of sufficiency, but in the end, that's not great. The big problem is we take this mindset into the worship of God and into our relation with him. And so as long as we looked at the law today, as long as I don't outright murder somebody, I expect God to love me and reward me. Look at how annoying all these people are, but I didn't murder any of them. But God says, I want you to look upon the people who bear my image, and I want you to desire good for them, to do such for them that even at a harm to yourself, you benefit others and that you harbor no desire for revenge, but rather even your enemies you want to see them blessed. That's what I do for you. And we basically just go back to, well, at least I didn't murder people who deserve it. Well, that's not good enough. And as long as we bring this foolish way of thinking, we never discover how great our sin is, and therefore we're never fully aware of how far we are separated from God. Every one of us is prone to this. This is not an accusation against anyone in particular. It is our nature. Admit it to yourself. You're arrogant. You minimize your sins. You're not adequately grateful for the incredible gift of having the gospel. And so you kind of live life assuming that you deserve to go to heaven because, come on, look at everybody else. I'm so much better. Well, here's the problem. We see from the beginning of Jeremiah that he is writing now to a remnant that is remaining in Jerusalem and Judea. A lot of Israelites have already been captured and enslaved and exiled to Assyria and Babylon, and Ezekiel is ministering to them. But here Jeremiah is reminding the Israelites who are still left, you're not better. Actually, you're here because you're the dregs. What king goes and finds rotting fruit to take back with him. No, he picked the best. Those are the ones who went into the exile. 
you guys are the filth, which is why you've been left here. So don't be so arrogant as to say, well, we're still in the promised land. Obviously, we're better. We can expect blessings to come. Rather, Jeremiah gives words of judgment. And if you remember your U.S. history, the Puritan preaching was called Jeremiads because there was so much preaching reminding people of the law of God in our failure and sinfulness. And that was Jeremiah's miserable mission, which is why God said, I will give you a face made of flint because what you're going to do is very unpleasant. People don't want to hear it. But he tells them, disaster is going to befall you. God is going to send even more wicked nations to judge you because you have worshipped idols and never trusted in me. And arrogantly, chapter 7, you keep thinking you're privileged because my house is here and that you've earned my house being here. But the reality is you have utter contempt for me because you think my house is a house of robbers and so you come unrepentant, filthy, and you keep on expecting the blessing without any sense of the obligation of honoring my name. And so I am going to pour out judgment upon you. And what you thought was a great blessing, I have the temple of the Lord, I'm blessed. No, you're even more cursed because you still won't listen. But there's a promise made. Despite your failing, despite your hating, dis uh, uh, despising the very grace I offer you of a sacrificial system and the Aaronic priesthood and a temple, I remain faithful to my covenant promises. Now remember what we saw last week when the Israelites entered the land they set up stones, plastered them, and wrote the law to remember the law, to pass by it every time they were doing commerce to see the law written down and remember what God expects of them. But that law brought about this condemnation we see in Jeremiah because it was external. They were not convinced of it. They did not delight in it. And so now judgment is being brought upon them. But God says, I made a covenant to have for myself a people, and this people will obtain the blessings, and it will begin with the first fruits, Israel, the remnant. At that time, declares the Lord, though I had the northern kings come and destroy you, now from the north I'm going to have my people brought back. And wherever they are spread out, they're going to come. And while at first we read already when we did Zechariah, it was a land that was desolate, here is described as a place where we will have the dance of merrymakers and singing and planting and harvesting and families will be fruitful, the herds and the flocks will be fruitful, there will be grain and wine and oil, a well-watered garden, that which I had once thrown down I will now build up. Why? This is important. Every generation falls into the same trap. When things are going well, we assume it's because of us. That generation suffered because, phew, they were horrible. My generation's enjoying this because we've done so well. But then we do the other. We ignore the benefits we've received, but as soon as anything goes bad, we blame the previous generation. Our fathers ate sour grapes and our teeth are set on edge. So the generation that's suffering through the exile, they blame it on the previous generation. I mean. They sinned against God. They didn't leave us good examples. Everything we did wrong is a consequence of them. We would have done wonderfully if we had it to ourselves. We don't deserve this. But when good is coming, of course we deserve this. Look at what we've merited and earned. And we forget all the work that went ahead of us to allow us to benefit. So to this generation who is hearing you're going to be blessed, God tells them, and it is not because of a covenant of works. It's not because now you guys are better than your fathers walking by those pillars, seeing the law written on the plaster, and you obey it, so I respond with rewarding you. No, it didn't work the first time, second time, 20th time, 100th time. It doesn't work for you. No, I choose to bless I am going to have a kingdom of people who obtain every blessing and finally eternal glory because I am going to make a new covenant. And this time the law will not be on the stones out there. They're going to be written on your hearts because that is the only way 
in which you will obtain this blessing. And so the promise is made of the old covenant being obsolete, having served its purpose, having demonstrated after generations man cannot earn or merit a reward from God, but only brings curses on his own head. So now I'm going to make a one-sided covenant where I fulfill everything. I take the penalty for your sins. I fulfill all righteousness by which you merit a reward. And then I will reward you for the righteousness that I earned. I'm going to write this on your hearts, a new covenant. We're just like everybody else, though. We keep believing. You know what? We enjoy all these good things because we're good people. We tried harder. And it's owed to us. It is what we deserve. And anything bad, well, it's somebody else's fault. Those guys out there, our parents' generation, everything bad is theirs. And so we're no different. And the church who received the letter to the Hebrews was no different than us or from every other generation. So they too were beginning to believe bad things are happening to us. It's not our fault. It's other people's fault. So we're going to get away from that and we're going to go and find for ourselves comfort by our own wisdom. And they were beginning to forsake the Christian church. And so God, by his spirit, inspires this apostle to write a letter and tell them, don't do it. Because a new covenant has been inaugurated and it is only applied in Christ's body, the church. And therefore, if you leave, you lose everything. And then you're back to works righteousness and you can't fulfill that. And so the curses will be poured out on you. And then he pulls a very interesting that God would have had actually Jeremiah 31 in the book of Jeremiah. Because, as I said, the old Puritan sermons called the Jeremiads are all about thunderous judgments against evildoers and lawbreakers. And yet... One of the most magnificent gospel passages is found in Jeremiah. In fact, it is the longest quoted Old Testament passage in the New. Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34. Why is this so important? Because it is only when we believe what God says through his prophets that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God that we finally say, then what about me? If all have sinned, and you must be holy, upright, and perfect to enter into the gates of righteousness that have opened up for the King of Glory, how do I enter in? What hope is there for me? And the answer from God is, I'll make a new covenant, and I will give you the righteousness. Putting the law on the heart is not just, I will make your conscience to understand it. No, I will put the fulfilled perfection into your heart so that I will look at you as holy and perfect according to every letter, jot, and tittle of the law as Christ fulfilled it for you. And therefore, I am obliged to reward righteousness. Remember, God hates sin. God has to punish sin. It's his nature. But there's the other side. God loves righteousness. He can't ignore righteousness. If he sees holiness and righteousness, he delights in it and draws it near to himself. And so if you are given Christ's righteousness, God cannot help but draw you to himself because he's made you beautiful. And you can see how he calls himself here a father, a husband, a shepherd. He loves you. He wants you to see this. And so he sends the apostles who are not adequate in themselves to be sufficient in Christ to proclaim this new covenant to you that would take you away from the letter written on stone to the spirit who is now in your hearts. And so even though the people are unworthy, he finds fault with them and the covenant that cannot bring them. Now he declares to the people, the days are coming when I will establish a new covenant. And in the words of the uh, Lord's Supper, Jesus says, this is my blood of the new covenant. And in this, I will bring you near to me that you will obtain the blessings. And that judgment, which is threatened and poured out against the Israelites, you will not face because I'll take it on myself as the Israelite and as the son. And now you will become sons and daughters of God through me 
because my righteousness will be given to you. So that's where we are now in the book of Hebrews. How did we get here? Well, first we were told angels are nothing compared to Christ. Your great prophet Moses is only a servant in the house, whereas Jesus is the owner of the house. Your Aaronic priesthood was populated with men who had to offer sacrifices for their own sins and then who still got old and died. But now there's a new priesthood with an order of one who does not die and who lives to make complete intercession for you. And that is Jesus after the order of Melchizedek. So Jesus is superior to angels, superior to Moses, superior to the Aaronic priesthood, and he sheds his blood as the new covenant blood. And that's why you have all these benefits. And therefore, you look forward to being built, planted, be made to celebrate, rejoice in God, and to recognize that you're brought into this new community. As we will see by the time we get to chapter 12, remember to encourage and uphold one another because you are the people of God. Why tell you all this? Why was it necessary for this to be recorded in the first place and now told to us? Well, because we have both the weakness and the stupidity of every one of our forefathers. We have the weakness in that we cannot obey the law of God perfectly. Much as we may want to, much as we may see benefit in it, no matter how many incentives we are given, we can't keep the law. And therefore, we would only obtain the curses from the law. We're also very stupid. Even with that knowledge, we still keep thinking we still deserve better. Okay, I'm not perfect, but, you know, doesn't mean I deserve eternal condemnation. Well, yes, that's what God says. And we are telling God he's wrong. You measured this incorrectly. Your judgments are false. That's the arrogance of all the world, whereby the world keeps telling the creator he doesn't know and understand his universe and the moral sphere. Well, that's a huge problem. So God now wants us to wrestle with this. He loves you. He wants you to obtain the blessing. And therefore, he will suffer in your place. What does he want from you? To recognize that he did this. Not to be contemptuous. You don't have to have the depth of understanding that God has of himself. None of us could. Most of us will never have the depth of understanding of someone who has lived a long life, gone from a sinful to, you know, like striving after holiness and has studied theology. There's a few rare people that you can really admire their depth and level of understanding. You're not required to have that. Jesus says, be childlike, not childish, childlike. You think the baby being held by the mom has any depth of understanding of what it means to be a mother and the sacrifices that were made and nothing. The child delights, however, when she hears the mother's voice, smiles and giggles, but expectantly waits for everything. Food, cleaning, never thinks about anyone else, never just knows mom will do it. Well, that's what's expected of us. When we gather here, Jesus says, confess to me that I am your Savior and Lord, that I have redeemed you, I have ransomed you, that I will bring you to a land of abundance. I will give you rest. Because under the old covenant, you'll get nothing. But in this new covenant, I'll put it in you and guarantee it. So for those who are looking for a better way, the apostle says, not only isn't there another way, or, or there, not only is there not a better way, there is no other way. Harking back to Jesus saying, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So, what do we learn from this? Well, the Jeremiads are appropriate insofar as to condemn an arrogant people. However, the Jeremiads are clearly not in chapter 31 because the only hope of people is the gospel. 
but you might not accept that the gospel is your only hope if you still keep thinking you can work your own righteousness. And that's what's being condemned. So the author brings this forth now and tells us, yes, a greater priest intercedes for you. And what makes this priest so much greater is that he does not tell you externally the law's commands. But this priest, because he is God, actually makes your heart to have that righteousness that makes you fit to dwell in the Lord's house forever. That brings us back to our three Psalms today. Psalm 24 recognizes the holiness of God revealed in his law and therefore that no one who has any sin may enter through the gates of glory into those ancient doors and enter heaven. The psalmist, however, remembers the promise of God. I will forgive your sins. I will remember them no more. So he confesses his sins in Psalm 25. In Psalm 26, the psalmist declares, I am righteous, O Lord, vindicate me. How do you go from Psalm 25 to Psalm 26? Well, not because you worked righteousness under the rules of the old covenant, but because you believe the promises of the new covenant that those who confess their sins and rest in Christ are now given the righteousness of Christ. And it is in that way that the psalmist can sing Psalm 26, I do belong with you and I deserve to be protected because you have put your spirit in me and forgiven me. That's what made me confess my sins in Psalm 25. Well, in that same way for you and me now, we live in a world in which we need to pray Psalm 26. We know we are no longer of this world. We know we have been loved and delivered, but we know there are enemies who seek to destroy the kingdom of God and we the subjects. And let's not fall into the temptation of separating ourselves from the church to avoid the persecutions. But we should remain even more firmly in the church knowing this is from where the blessings are dispensed. That God has chosen here to encourage us. And that's why as the book of Hebrews goes on, it reminds us of all those who underwent great times of tribulation and suffering but persevered and then says, since you know this great cloud of witnesses is now also there cheering you on. Not standing in judgment of you saying, oh, I went so much and I survived. How come you can't survive your little things? That's not what they're doing. These are the fanatics sitting in the stands cheering you on because they know you can go all the way. And since we have this crowd of witnesses, not only should we not fail, let's encourage everyone around us. And all this because God set a new covenant whereby his righteousness is worked in our hearts. And so that's where the story is going. That is our great hope. That is why we should be confident that we will not fall away. Because God loved us and already drew us in. And this is why we should encourage one another, because it is difficult for many, but it's not hopeless for anyone. So, beloved, consider that God gave this great promise of the new covenant in Jeremiah, the book in which he condemns so much the sinfulness of Israel. But you can see why he did it. He wanted them to give up their self-righteous confidence that we have the temple of the Lord, others have been punished in the exile, we're still here. Now he had to break through that arrogant stubbornness. But once he did, where does he go? Not just, I'm going to give you a chance to do it right this time under the Mosaic law and the Aaronic priesthood. Uh-uh. I'm getting rid of the whole system. I see its weakness and obsolescence. It was never the saving covenant. No, a new covenant where the priest will be the sacrifice, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. How glorious, how magnificent that this one is Jesus who loves you so much. There's nowhere better to go. So that's why he wants us to be confident and persevere in Christ's body, the church, and to obtain the everlasting inheritance that was always the goal and destiny of the people of God. Let's pray. We ask, O Lord, our God, for your spirit to continue to work in us that we would be firmly convinced 
that the blessings we enjoy are undeserved but are a free gift of grace merited for us by Jesus Christ. Help us to understand that we are prone to foolishness and therefore we need the spiritual nourishment provided through the gospel preaching and the sacraments to strengthen our faith. We ask, O oh Lord, we would also encourage one another in love to good works and to growing in sanctification in order that your body, the church, would visibly be different than the world, a place of peacemakers and of those who glorify God and rejoice in Christ, who is our salvation. So we thank you, O oh Lord, for this new covenant that is forever, that will never grow old or disappear, but in which we find eternal life. We ask for you to be exalted and glorified for being so gracious and loving to us. Amen. As I said, now we continue as a people who are in that company of the saints ascending the mountain of the Lord, going through the ancient doors, and as others would condemn us, as Satan would seek to come and say, you don't deserve to be there. Let us remember the promises of Romans chapter 8. Who is Satan to bring an accusation against God's elect when it is Christ who justifies? So having confessed our sins and resting in Christ, let us confidently approach the gate and knowing that being redeemed, that we may with the church worship and glorify our God. Let us stand and sing Psalm 26, Be Thou My Judge. Be thou my judge, O righteous Lord, try thou mine inmost heart. I walk with steadfast trust in thee, nor from thy ways depart. O search me, Lord, and prove me now, thy mercy I adore. I choose thy truth to be my guide and sinful ways abhor. My hands I wash in innocence and seek thine altar, Lord, that there I may with a full voice thy wondrous words record. The habitation of thy house is ever Please be seated. Beloved, as we come to the table of the Lord, remember that here we have an affirmation of the new covenant in Christ's shed blood. And it is because we are in need of being assured that the accusations of the wicked one will not stand and that we are indeed the redeemed of the Lord, that we are reminded that yes, the new covenant has been inaugurated and that we are members of this covenant. And so Christ Jesus, would have you rejoicing. Remember, the dance of the merrymakers who delight in the abundance of what we have. And yes, now we only have a down payment, but the fullness is yet to come. So this table then is a sealing sign confirming what you have just heard. The old covenant is gone. That's why we don't have a bloody animal sacrifice. But we do remember and apply the shed blood of the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world because we live in the new covenant. 
We read in the scriptures that the Lord Jesus, in the night in which he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner, still relying on works righteousness of the old covenant, not believing Christ is the God-man, that person will be guilty of profaning the body and the blood of the Lord. Now, when Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me, he ordained this holy supper as a consum memorial and a visible proclamation of his death. As we partake of this communion supper, therefore, we bear witness that we believe and confess the historical reality that our Lord Jesus was sent by the Father into the world. He took upon himself our flesh and blood and that he bore the wrath of God on the cross in our place. We also confess that he endured the suffering and death of the cross for our benefit that we might live through him. He was once the forsaken one that we would forever be received by God the Father. So the sacrament confirms us in God's unfailing love and his covenant faithfulness. Our Lord promises, moreover, that as we eat the bread and drink the cup, we're fed his crucified body and shed blood. To this end, he gives us the Holy Spirit, his life-giving spirit, through whom the body and blood of our Lord become life-giving nourishment for our souls. So he unites us with himself and imparts the benefits that he obtained for us in his sacrifice when we are partakers by a true and living faith. The Holy Sacrament is also a means of grace that unites you and me to one another in the bond of the Spirit. Because the Apostle declares that we who are separated and many are in Christ one body as we are partakers of the one loaf. Thus, even as he unites us with himself, he is also strengthening the bond between you and me, all of us, his children. Finally, the remembrance of our Lord's death also revives in us the hope of his return. Since he commanded us to do this until he comes, the Lord assures us he will come again to take us home to enter through the ancient gates of righteousness. Hence, as we commune with him now under a veil, bread and wine, we're also being assured that we will behold him face to face and rejoice in his glory when he appears. So to celebrate the Supper of the Lord properly, it's necessary that we do two things. One, consider your estate under the covenant of works, sinful, accursed, and hate this condition because you are ungrateful to God and you know you deserve his divine wrath. But don't stop there. Also examine whether you have heard and believed the gospel that has been proclaimed to you this day, that a new covenant has been ordained in which God will remember your sins no more, apply to you the righteousness of Christ freely as a gift, so completely that God sees you, just as he would look at Christ in his perfect law-keeping. Beloved, unto him who loves us, and who released us from our sins by the shedding of his own blood, and has made us to be his kingdom and priests in this kingdom to his God and Father who offer up the sacrifice of the praise of our lips to Christ Jesus be the glory and the dominion forever and evermore. Amen. Let's pray. O Lord our God, help us to understand how blessed a people we are to be drawn here this day. Also give to us true humility as we receive the bread and the wine testifying that it took the death of the only begotten Son of God for our sins because no amount of works or sacrifices, even if we were to kill every animal in creation, would be enough to atone for our sins. May we be thankful that you made such a gracious provision for sinners like us, and may we be thankful. And may we also mature and grow in sanctification and holiness of life, loving one another even those whom we formerly considered enemies. Unite us in love to one another with Christ our head, and may we be a witness to the world of the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ offered to people of every tribe and tongue and nation. Amen.
Beloved, lift up your spirits and hearts on high. We lift them up to the Lord. Elders will dismiss you to come receive the elements and we will partake together. The Lord of hosts will prepare a lavish banquet on this mountain and he will call all peoples to come, a banquet of aged wine with choice pieces of meat filled with marrow. And on this mountain, he'll swallow up that terror that is over all the peoples, the veil stretched over all the nations. He will swallow up death for all time. He'll wipe away tears from all faces and remove the shame from his people on the earth. And on that day, we in the assembly will declare this is our God on whom we waited, that he would save us. This is the Lord our God. Let us rejoice and be glad in him. Surely our griefs he himself bore, our sorrows he carried. We ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted, but his piercing was for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment for our well-being fell on him. By his scourgings, we are healed. The spirit of the Lord Yahweh is upon me because the Lord anointed me to bring good news to the afflicted, sending me to bind up the brokenhearted, to declare liberty to captives, freedom to prisoners, and to announce the favorable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance upon the enemies of God to comfort all who suffer and mourn, giving them a garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of sorrows, a mantle of praise instead of fainting, that we would be called the oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in yourself. But he who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. I will raise him up on the last day. My flesh is true food, my blood is true drink. It was the Father's good pleasure for the fullness of deity to dwell in Jesus and through him to reconcile all things to himself, making peace through the blood of his cross. The gathered saints are the assembled people of God. We are a holy nation and a royal priesthood. And while it is difficult for us to imagine that this is a foretaste of glory, it is indeed a small down payment that you see people from every tribe and tongue have been gathered by God and by his grace made and washed clean. That you may be aware not only of your union with Christ, but now in the church with one another, Jesus would have us to remember always his sacrifice. And that's why he took the bread and broke it and declared, this is my body. Beloved, take, eat, remember, and believe the body of the Lord Jesus Christ crucified for you in order that your sins would be not only canceled out, but forever separated from the memory of God. And instead, you would be credited with the perfect righteousness of Jesus forevermore. Jesus took the cup and he declared, this is the blood of the new covenant, the one Jeremiah prophesied about, wherein you would no longer be called to external righteousness, but rather the perfect heartfelt righteousness of Christ would be credited to you. So take, drink, remember, and believe the graciousness of God, the provision of Christ, and your redemption and eternal hope of glory in Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Our God, we know our weak frames. We understand we are prone to the same foolishness of every other generation. We ask, O oh Lord, that instead you would work in our hearts by your spirit, that we would give all glory to you as our confidence will rest entirely in you. And we would be used instruments by your hand to bring the light of the gospel to the nations. 
May we encourage one another to love and good works. May we continue to be an influence in our families, but especially that you would draw in those whom we love. And may we make that sacrifice, fighting against sin and growing in holiness. Thank you for this nourishment that allows us to continue to persevere on the way until we should with the assembled saints see those ancient doors of glory opened with the King himself leading us in triumph. Amen. Beloved, what a wonderful, glorious gospel the Lord Jesus has given us. And we desire to see that this gospel be proclaimed, which of course in the material world requires work and effort. And so we need to train the next generation of ministers to fill pulpits. And we need to train a generation of men and women willing to go to the ends of the earth as evangelists and missionaries. And so we give prayerfully that these provisions would be made. And so we desire to see and participate in the work of evangelism around the world. So we ask you to give your offerings in such a spirit and prayerfully, and consider also yourselves or your children being called to these works as well. Let us conclude by declaring that we do worship and praise the one true God who has loved us enough to give us life from the dead. Let us stand and sing our Trinitarian doxology printed on the last page. in the desert God did not forsake his people and now on our pilgrimage he is also with us and so the same ironic blessing can be proclaimed with the same confidence and assurance of our entering into Christ's rest and the land of eternal promise Yahweh the Lord bless you and keep you the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you the Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you peace so in all your tribulations be assured you are already more than conquerors through Christ Jesus, who loves you. Be assured, as we have just heard, nothing will be able to separate you from the love of God. God's love for you is through the person, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.